Welcome back to Small Business Quick Wins presented by Thrive. We have a great episode today because I have a fantastic guest. Scott Jeffrey Miller is the seven-time best-selling author of all of these fantastic books that focus on management and marketing and your career and your business. And the guy is just a ball of energy. And he's going to come on today and we're going to talk about things that you could be doing in your business that can have a huge impact just by changing your mindset a little bit. So Scott, welcome to Small Business Quick Wins. Thanks for being here. How are you? Jay, my honor. I'm on fire today. Thanks for the spotlight. Appreciate it. Excellent. So before we jump into some of these quick wins, tell us a little bit about Scott. Who is Scott? How did Scott become Scott? What's going on? You know, 30-year career in the leadership development industry. You probably have heard of Stephen Covey, the author of the book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I spent 25 years with his team, eventually in the C-suite as the CMO. Prior to that, I spent four years with the Walt Disney Company. Since then, I've authored seven books, some more successful than others. I host, like you, several podcasts, did a stint as an iHeart radio host. And my day job is I own a talent literary and speaking agency, and I help a lot of authors and entrepreneurs get their ideas and their brands out into the world. Sometimes it's via books or keynoting, TV programs, documentaries, things like that. And most importantly, I, with my wife, are the parents to three young boys, and we're trying to raise gentle men in a not-so-gentle, menly world. So I want to ask you a question that we weren't going to talk about, but a lot of listeners to this podcast are in the home services category. Maybe it's plumbing, maybe whatever. Didn't you just have like a massive leak in your home? Wasn't it like the worst thing of all time? Well, it's not the worst thing of all time compared to what some people in the world are going through, right? So in life, everything is perspective. But we did. We had a storm in the summertime and a a, a gutter broke and water flowed from the heavens down into the floors. (laughs) and, And trying to find a competent and trustworthy contractor took some time. We had a little bit of a disagreement with the insurance company, meaning they said no. We said, oh, hell no. And so we came to terms on that. And after five months of that, we're back in business, meaning people can actually walk in our front door now and not say, why is there no roof? Why is there no ceiling in your house? So I feel like you're uniquely suited because of your work life and also your recent personal life to give us all some uh, advice about how to lead our small businesses, how to yeah. work with the people in our in our business. Tell us, what, how should we be functioning? Yeah, let me remind you of something. Whether you are a plumber or an electrician, whether you are a florist, whether you own a home cleaning crew, I don't care what it is. That's not the business you're in. You are in the relationship business. And this may sound like a cliche, but I want you to listen to me. At the end of the day, everybody is in the people business. Your suppliers, your vendors, your customers, your employees. You are in the business of developing relationships, of listening to people, of understanding what is their win look like? What is their struggle? You are in the relationship business and not all of us are expert at it. I'm not, I don't like silence. I have a stutter, I have a speech impediment. I'm fairly anxious. I like to move conversations along. I like to be the one leading and speaking, not the one listening and following. And so I want to remind all of your listeners that are entrepreneurs and solopreneurs, at the end of the day, you need to be better at developing relationships. For some of us, it comes easy. And for others, if it's more awkward and difficult. But this is how you recruit and retain talented people is relating to them. At the end of the day, you're the owner. What you say goes. But you want to make sure you're developing a culture. Even your small business has a culture. And as the leader, as the owner, You are setting the standard. Every conversation, every email, every social post, every interaction, every text, you are either building or destroying culture. Remember, people don't quit jobs. They quit jackass leaders and they quit bad cultures. And this is not a human resource cliche. This is life. So if you have a company that you're the business owner, maybe you have three people working with you, you can have a culture and be only four people? Well, no no doubt. Because you either have a culture of gossip or you have a culture of keeping confidences. You have a culture of being on time and punctual or of phoning it in. You have a culture of making and keeping commitments or a culture of over-promising and under-delivering. And let me tell you, it's why not every owner should also be a leader of people. Because at the end of the day, you want to write down all the things you want to see in your three or four or 40 employees. 
And you have to be the model of that. Dr. Stephen Covey, who kind of raised me professionally, he wrote the seminal book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He said, be a light, not a judge. Be a model, not a critic. You have to model all the behaviors you want to see in every member of your team. By the way, at the end of the day, your culture is merely the collection of how everybody behaves, how stuff gets done around them. If you're the know-it-all, if you're the genius in the room, that's your culture. Everybody waits to be told what to do. If you're the guy that sits down and says, listen, I have some ideas, but I'm not exactly sure this is the best thing for our profitability, for how I'm going to fund next week's payroll, I'd like your opinion. Now people feel that is the culture of inclusion and value. You can still make the indecision while asking people for their opinion. And so I think it's vital that you take responsibility for you are the standard barrier. You set the cultures by what you say and don't say, by what you do and don't do, by what you forgive and what you punish. Everybody is watching everything you're doing and saying. And I think that's so true. And I think that you can't expect someone that works for you to work harder than you, right? If you're not putting in the effort, then they're going to see that and they're not going to put in the effort. If you're getting to work late, then they're going to think that that's acceptable. Like, is, is that what you mean? That it, it's ultimately leading by example, which will define the culture? I mean, in the podcast right there, that's it, is you have to set the standard. By the way, I'll tell you, Jay, vulnerability is a leadership competency. I, I know nothing about surgery or about athletics or sports or AI. I know a lot about leadership and building cultures. At the end of the day, yeah, you're setting the standard and vulnerability is a leadership competency. Call your team together and say, you know what? Listen, I know that I've got strengths and weaknesses and sometimes my strengths get overplayed. I know I can be, you know, this way or that way. I'm working on trying to improve that. I want to build a company culture where you feel comfortable saying, hey, Scott, is this really a crisis or do you just love to work in crisis? Like talk about what your challenges are. I love a good crisis. I do my best work in urgency addiction. And if I don't have a crisis, I'll cook one up because I like to save the day. I like the dopamine. It's important for me to say to my team, you all know I love a good crisis. And so if you ever see me doing that, take me aside. Don't, don't post it on Reddit. Don't post it on Glassdoor. Call me aside and say, hey, Scott, is this really urgent or is this just you needing to feel it's urgent? And if I'm mature and self-aware enough, I'll say, Jay, you know what? Thanks for calling me aside in private. You're right. This could be done on Friday. There's just so much emotional intelligence involved in leadership. Be willing to call yourself out. Be willing to use yourself as a good and also as a poor example. You may need to move outside of your own comfort zone as a leader. You may have to actually say, you know what? I've been in my office too long. I need to go out and meet with clients. Let's go do some client meetings and we'll debrief it in the car and we'll talk about the things that I did well and the things that I could have improved upon. You will build such a culture of trust and transparency with your team, they will never quit you. Let me finish with this. People don't quit leaders who love them. And I mean this in a professional sense. You want your people to know that you care about them, that you know they've got a bigger life than just work, right? They've got a son who's vaping or a mother-in-law who's got dementia or a bill they can't pay. I didn't say become their baker or their psychiatrist, but you want your people to know that you care about them, not just what they can do for you. This is not leadership babble. This is real, practical leadership culture advice. Well, I'm going to take that to heart because culture really can catapult your business. And the other thing is in this full employment economy, a lot of people have jobs right now, right? Unemployment is low. It's hard to hire. And it's really rough when you lose somebody of value on your team and they leave. And a lot of times they leave because of the culture in your organization, right? They're not always leaving because they're not making the most money. They're not leaving because they don't have the job title they want. They're leaving because of the culture. Is that fair? Owners, leaders, listen to me. You should always be assuming everyone is leaving. Every one of your employees is always looking for a new job, including your executive leaders or your longest. They're always being recruited by somebody on LinkedIn. Why would they not be? All your competitors can hire them, pay them five more thousand dollars an hour or a year or 10 more thousand dollars, and they're ready to roll. You've done all the hard work. I'm not saying run paranoid. I'm saying run aware. 
every one of your people is always being recruited or thinking about something better. So you've got to give them a reason to stay. You have to constantly be in re recruiting mode. That also means if you have someone who's underperforming, you have to deal with it. You have to move outside of your comfort zone and address the problems and give people feedback on their blind spots. Because if you want to disillusion your highest performers, tolerate underperformers. You have to be able to deal with issues that are really hard. No one likes to have high courage conversation. No one likes to give feedback to people in their blind spots. No one has to like to tell people to wear deodorant or to come to work on time or to stop being the um, devil's advocate all the time. This is your responsibility as a leader is to address the problems and equally celebrate successes. Call people out positively in public, right? Praise in public, scold in private, if that's the right term. You are responsible for the culture that you build. Assume people are always magnetizing away from you and your job is to recruit them. Last thought here. You need to check your ego. Your job is to be a talent magnet. You should be hiring people who are smarter than you, better educated, more technically talented. Your job is not to be the smartest person in the room. Your job is to be the genius maker of others. Your job is to check your ego and be comfortable bringing people in who are more talented than you are and exponentiating their talent in the organization. People will see that and respect you for it. Well, I'm very good at finding people that are smarter than me. That is my core competency. So uh, the last segment of this thing, we go in a totally different direction. And that is, you've given a lot of great advice, excellent advice. But now I want you to give everyone a piece of horrible advice. What is a piece of advice that someone has given you in your life that just was terrible or ridiculous, oh. or why would anybody ever want to follow it? Have you, or have you only gotten great advice? No, 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 I know exactly what it is. It's most people who've gone to college, have a business degree or done some kind of course, they've been taught this term total addressable market. Like what's the largest viable market, right? Oh, it's 80 million people. It's hogwash. I think Seth Godin says it best. Counterintuitively, think of your smallest viable market. What are the fewest numbers of, number of customers you really need to explode your business? Not one or two, because when they go south, your business goes south. But what's your smallest viable market? What is their avatar, right? Is it dentists that live in this zip code with this problem that speak this language? Think about it counterintuitively. What is the fewest number of clients that you could get deeply pervasive in that could refer you out, become charismatic ambassadors for you, can become free salespeople for you. Don't get a wash in trying to boil the ocean. Get very clear on who is your customer, what are their habits, where do they hang out, what do they call the problem, and then do you call the problem the same thing? Are you in their mind, in their world, versus trying to be everything to everyone? It's counterintuitive. It takes for some unnatural discipline and focus, but it's a formula that the greatest business and marketing minds will repeat. How do you get one that. customer? And then who is your next customer? And then who is your next customer? And how do you deeply pervade their businesses and have them become unabashed evangelists for you? That is awesome. Like literally the opposite of everything you always hear. And that is amazing. Well, this has been super valuable. Everybody, listen, I want everyone to follow Scott Jeffrey Miller on every social media platform that you use. He's my number one favorite follow on social media. I'm not blowing smoke. And his latest book, Career on Course, another number one bestseller. It is phenomenal. You could find it on Amazon. It's Career on Course, Scott Jeffrey Miller. Scott, thank you so much for being here. Jay, my pleasure. Thank you for your friendship. All right, everybody, thanks again for being on Small Business Quick Wins, presented by Thrive. We'll see you next time.